Do what you can. Do not let neglect grab you by the throat. Don't let neglect stall you on your path toward prosperity and health. Being able to become powerful, influential, rich beyond wildest imagination. Don't neglect what you can do. If you can read, read. If you can change, change. If you can grow, grow. If you can take one step, take one step. Do not neglect to do whatever you can do at the moment, of course. You can't run a multi-billion dollar business today. Mark couldn't either 10 years ago. Mark couldn't either 5 years ago. But I'm telling you today he can do it because step by step, year by year, he took on what he can do. He didn't neglect it. He did the meetings he could do. He made the calls he could make. He read the books he could read. He took the classes he could take. And step by step, he got himself ready. I'm telling you, do not neglect to do whatever you can do because it'll work miracles of personal development first, productivity second. Now, do what you can. Here's number two. Do the best you can. If it's a foggy night and you can only see 100 feet, how can you see another 100 feet? Answer. Walk the first 100 feet. Walk as far as you can see, and then you can see some more. Walk as far as you can see, and then you can see some more. So, what you picked up here, just do it as far as you can see it. And I promise you, if you'll execute as far as you can see it, you'll be able to see more. Do that, then you can see more. And finally, get in tune of doing the best you can, and you'll have the activity that will develop the disciplines that will set the sail so that you can say, it doesn't matter how the wind blows, I'm prepared. For some people, they see discipline as sort of an ugly word. You know, don't talk to me about discipline. But what you must understand is that discipline is a most incredible creative force. Discipline builds a career. Discipline develops good health. Discipline forms the most incredible marriage. Discipline puts together a friendship that won't quit forever. Discipline develops skills that can be magnified. You know and touch the world. Disciplines open up music. You know, you can't have incredible music without discipline. In fact, we call them the disciplines. We call architecture and music, and we call playing an instrument, we call sculpturing, we call painting, we call writing, composing. We call those the disciplines. And the disciplines give us the indication that yes, it doesn't come except by discipline. But it also means that the discipline is the open door to the creative process, to turn nothing into something, and to turn imagination into reality. So, here's what you must learn to do. Appreciate the disciplines and welcome the disciplines. Here's a good question to ask. What other discipline could I begin that would open up a whole new expression in my life of turning imagination into reality? Without discipline, there is no enterprise. Without discipline, there is no magnificent structure. Without discipline, there is no music. Without discipline, there is no health. You know, there is no advantage. There is no future. So, discipline is all when it comes to imagination, having something real, believing in it, and turning it into reality. The key to development is to be all that you can possibly be. I don't know what your talents are. I don't know what your skills are. But here's what I'm probably right on. That you're behind on an accelerated effort toward your full development. I would suggest that now, for some of you, I know that's probably really not true. But even as I look at my own life because you know, I'm tempted to procrastinate just like everybody else. You know, I should have written 30 books by now. I've only written 4 or 5. You know, I should have done a lot of things. But I haven't, you know, I got distracted. And all of us, you know, have these challenges. But what could I become? What could I become? I had one of my dearest friends. I've lost him. He died at age 53, one day, and he drank a little too much. David drank a little too much, but he did all kinds of things. He was a builder, and he was a dreamer, and he did a lot of things. But his drinking sort of kept him in a fog for like years and years. About six years ago, he was sitting at the yacht club, and he was in a fog, and suddenly it occurred to him. I wonder what I could have accomplished all these years if I hadn't have been in this sort of foggy state. And he said, that did it, and the last six years before he died, he was free, and he accomplished some incredible things in that last six years. Being all that you can be and not let habits drag you down, not let things, you know, sidetrack you from the full development of what you have the capable of being. What could your heart encompass if you really had the chance and you really had the disciplines and really got to it? What could you really become? What could you earn? How healthy could you really be? How many books could you write? How many poems could you write? So, here's what I would ask of you. If you feel that you're a little bit stalled wherever you are in your progress, I'm asking you to correct that. 
I'm asking you to see if you can't possibly be on a more accelerated track toward your possibilities and your full development. Here's what life is all about. To become all that we can possibly be, the full development of all of your potential. That's number one. Number two is the wise use of all of your resources. That's what life is all about. Discipline. If there is a magic word that stands out above all the rest, this is the one. Discipline. Discipline is the bridge between thought and accomplishment, the bridge between inspiration and value achievement, the bridge between necessity and productivity. Remember, all good things are upstream. The passing of time takes us to drifting, and drifting only brings us the negative, the disastrous, the disappointment, and the failure. Failure is not a cataclysmic event. It is not generally the result of one major incident, but rather a long list of accumulated little failings. Failing in life is failing to think today, failing to act today, failing to care, to strive, to climb, to learn, to keep trying day by day. If your goal requires that you write 10 letters today and you write only 3, you are down 7 letters. If you want to make 5 calls and you only make 1, you are down 4 calls. If your plan calls for saving 10 today and you save none, you're down 10 today. Now, the danger is looking at an undisciplined day and concluding that no great harm has been done. It doesn't seem like such a bad day. But add up these days to make a year, and then add up those years to make a lifetime. And perhaps you can now see how repeating today's small failures can easily turn your life into a major disaster. Success, on the other hand, is just the same process in reverse. If you plan to make 10 calls and you end the day making 15, now you're up 5 calls. If you then get up a few on letters, move up the savings numbers, you can see what a massive difference it could make in a year, and what wealth and accomplishment awaits for a lifetime. Discipline is like a set of magic keys that unlocks all the doors of wealth, happiness, sophistication, culture, high self-esteem, pride, joy, accomplishment, satisfaction, and success. The first key to discipline is awareness of the need for and the value of discipline, and especially the discipline to make the changes. What will it take? What must I do? And what must I become to get all I want from my life? The second key is the willingness, more than that, the eagerness, to maintain your new discipline deliberately, wisely, consistently. And the third key to discipline is the commitment to master the circumstances of your daily life, to see and harness the opportunities, to make something of the sun and the rain, the good as well as what comes in the guise of misfortune. Discipline does many things, but most important of all is what it does for you. It makes you feel better about yourself. Even the smallest discipline can have an incredible effect on your attitude and the good feeling you get. That surging feeling of self-worth that comes from starting a new discipline is almost as good as the feeling that comes from the accomplishment of the discipline. Second, a new discipline immediately alters your life direction. You don't change destinations immediately, that is yet to come, but you can change direction immediately, and direction is very important. Third, discipline cooperates with nature. Everything strives. It is a common life function. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it can. Everything strives to become all it can possibly be, and that striving to become is what discipline is all about. Disciplining ourselves to fulfill our natural potential, to become all that we can be. And finally, discipline attracts opportunity. Opportunity is always looking for ambition and skill in action. Discipline taps the unlimited power of commitment, the human will in action, driven by inspiration, enticed by desire, tempered by reason, guided by intelligence, can bring you to that high and lofty place called the good life. So start the new process. You can begin a new habit, no matter how small it is. Small isn't important. Whether or not you start, and whether or not you continue, are all that is important. So to have a prosperous life, start a prosperity plan. To become wealthy, start a wealth plan. Remember, you don't have to be wealthy to have a wealth plan. A person with no means can have a rich plan. If you are ill, start a health plan. If you don't have energy, start an energy plan. If you don't feel good, start a feel-good plan. If you're not smart, start a smart plan. If you can't, start a can plan. If you haven't, start a have plan. Anyone can. Even a bad person can start hearing good messages and reading good books. Recognize that the start of the better life, the happy life, the wealthy life, is today. This is exciting. Both the process and the result can begin today. Start the new journey today. If you think of a new idea, today is the day to begin the discipline of putting that idea into action. Set this day up as a long, busy, exciting start for your new life.
Get your first book for your new library today. Begin your new practice of setting goals today. Start clearing out a drawer of your new orderly desk today. Start eating an apple a day on your new health plan today. Put some money in your new investment for fortune account today. Start reading with intensity for your new wealth of mind plan today. Write a postponed letter today. Make a delayed telephone call today. Pick up your camera and take a picture of something to start your new treasury of photographs today. Get some momentum going on your new commitment to the better life. See how many activities you can pile on in this first day. Go all out. Break away from the negative downward of gravity. Start the thrusters going. Prove to yourself that waiting is over, hoping is past, and that faith and action have now taken charge. It's a new day, a new beginning for your new life. With discipline, you can't believe the list of positive moves you can make in the first day of your new beginning. We must all suffer from one of two pains. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. The difference is discipline weighs ounces while regret weighs tons. The worst thing one can do is not to try, to be aware of what one wants and not give in to it. To spend years in silent hurt wondering if something could have materialized, never knowing. When you know what you want and you want it bad enough, you'll find a way to get it. Don't wait, take action now. Success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. Discipline is a constant human awareness of the need for action and a conscious act by us to implement that action. When our awareness aligns with our action simultaneously, we initiate a valuable sequence of disciplined behaviors. On the flip side, when a considerable gap separates our awareness from our actions, it leads to procrastination, the act of postponing tasks from today to tomorrow. Procrastination stands in stark contrast to discipline. While our inner voice may suggest delaying tasks, discipline urges us to act promptly and to the best of our abilities today and always, until the desired action becomes second nature. So how can one resist the allure of distractions and maintain focus on their goals? By cultivating unwavering self-discipline, committing to daily practice, and avoiding negative influences and idle chatter. The power of influence and associations, along with one's consistent self-discipline, should never be underestimated. Firstly, genuine discipline isn't the softest route. Most folks would rather snuggle in bed till 10 than rise at 6. It's far simpler to indulge in late nights, snooze in, stroll in tardy, and depart ahead of time. It's a breeze to shun reading, flaking on the telly trunks cracking open a book. Merely skimming the surface is simpler than diving deep. Prolonging action is always easier than plunging in. Dabbling is ever more straightforward than full-on engagement. Picture a world where there's no need to make our beds. Each down maintain orderly garages, meet tax obligations, or turn up for work the following day. Can you conjure the consequences? Not much. You're spot on. For whatever the reason, the system we live in and contribute to is designed to make the easiest things in life the most unprofitable. Profitable seems to be the most difficult. Our world is and always will be a constant battle between the life of ease and its momentary rewards and a life of discipline and its far more significant rewards. Each path exacts its toll, the toll of discipline or the toll of regret. We shall settle our debts with one or the other. Regret speaks in mournful tones of what could have been, echoing in moments where time can't be rewound. There's no room for second chances, no pondering what if. Make your choice, but know that both paths exact a cost. The cost of discipline or the cost of regret. One demands mere pennies, the other, a fortune. According to Dovey, while there may be countless young men willing to sacrifice their lives for the truth, only a select few would dedicate five years to truly understand what the truth entails. The act of dying for the truth may seem more dramatic than the gradual discipline of studying it, advancing step by step, day by day, and month by month. However, when considering the bigger picture, is sacrificing one's life for the truth truly easier than committing to daily disciplines? The first lesson of discipline is its lack of simplicity. The subsequent lesson is its demand for constant dedication. We've affirmed that consistent self-discipline is paramount. Interestingly, the discipline required to tidy your bed daily mirrors that essential for thriving in the business realm. The orderliness of your garage reflects the orderliness of your business. All disciplines permeate and influence every aspect of our lives. Should we remain disciplined in one sphere but lack in another, the lethargic tendencies will inevitably encroach and undermine the discipline front. 
The detrimental habits in one area will erode our self-discipline in the areas we've diligently cultivated. Consistency must remain unwavering. Discipline involves the mind mastering control over our lives. It comprises standards we've chosen as our personal code of conduct. Discipline entails imposing upon ourselves the obligation to uphold these standards. Once we've embraced these behavioral and ethical benchmarks, we commit to upholding them. Failure to do so renders disciplined activity impossible. We often vocalize our standards to relatives, friends, and associates, fervently defending our beliefs while disregarding them in practice. We admonish our children for excessive TV consumption while indulging in it ourselves. We demand full utilization of work hours from employees yet extend our lunch breaks to three hours. Do as I say, not as I do, epitomizes inconsistency, leading to a loss of credibility both externally and internally. A lack of discipline is surpassed only by the ignorance or disregard of its necessity and value. These individuals meander aimlessly, altering procedures, standards, loyalties, and commitments at will, leaving behind fractured relationships, unfinished ventures, and unfulfilled pledges. This chaos arises from either non-existent discipline or its sporadic imposition, rendering it ineffective. Here's the third step to mastering consistent self-discipline. Firstly, grasp that discipline isn't the path of least resistance. Secondly, embrace the reality that discipline requires your undivided attention every single day. And the third step towards honing self-discipline embodies a philosophy that encapsulates one of life's exceptional promises. Simply put, for every discipline and effort, there exists a manifold reward. This principle echoes the law of sowing and reaping, an extension of the biblical doctrine proclaiming, as you sow, so shall you reap. Now let's uncover a distinctive aspect of the law of sowing and reaping. Not only does it assert that we shall harvest what we plant, but it also pledges a multiplied return. Life is governed by myriad laws that elucidate human conduct. Yet, this law shines forth as paramount. For every disciplined effort, there awaits a manifold reward. What a profound notion. Should you deliver unparalleled service, your reward will be amplified. Should you conduct yourself with fairness, integrity, and patience towards others, your reward will be magnified. Should you bestow generously without expectation of return, your reward will surpass your anticipations. However, bear in mind the crucial term here is discipline. Anything of value demands meticulous care and unwavering discipline. Children, much like adults, require discipline. They need a structured environment with clearly defined boundaries to feel safe and empowered to explore and develop. It's crucial for them to learn the difference between right and wrong, acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Without consistent discipline, they risk confusion about how they should conduct themselves. Similarly, our thoughts demand discipline. We must establish internal boundaries and codes of conduct, where our thoughts will become muddled, leading to confusion and uncertainty in life. Confused thoughts yield confused outcomes. Take a moment to reflect on your current circumstances. Is there an area of your life that requires attention? Perhaps you're driving, feeling frustrated with slow traffic, or experiencing conflict with a loved one, allowing anger to cloud your communication. This could be an opportunity to evaluate your need for a new discipline. Maybe you're on the brink of a significant change, whether it's giving up, starting over, or pursuing a new venture. The missing ingredient for future success could be a fresh self-imposed discipline that compels you to persist drive harder, and work more diligently than ever before. The most effective discipline is the one we impose on ourselves. Don't wait until circumstances force discipline upon you. It would be tragic to realize that someone else believed in you more than you believed in yourself, compelling you to take action when you were content to let success elude you. Remember, our lives serve as either a cautionary tale or an inspiration. A caution against neglect, self-pity, and aimlessness, or an example of talent maximized, self-discipline embraced, and goals pursued with unwavering determination. In conclusion, embracing discipline is not merely a choice. It's a commitment to shaping our lives with purpose and direction. It's about understanding that every disciplined effort we exert yields not just a single reward, but multiple dividends that enrich our journey. Whether it's in our personal relationships, professional pursuits, or inner thoughts, discipline is the guiding force that transforms potential into reality. As we navigate the complexities of life, let us remember that the path of discipline may not always be the easiest, but it leads to profound fulfillment and lasting success.
By fostering unwavering self-discipline, we not only unlock our true potential but also inspire others through our example. So let us choose the path of discipline over regret, knowing that every disciplined step we take brings us closer to the life we envision. Let us embrace the challenges, uphold our standards, and remain steadfast in our pursuit of excellence. For in the end, it is discipline that empowers us to become the architects of our destiny and the authors of our legacy. Confidence is such an important quality of strong character. It's really a form of optimism, a certainty that things are going to turn out the way you want and that you have the power to make that happen. Confidence is also one of the most elusive and misunderstood qualities of a strong character. How do we recognize a confident individual? Is it someone who dresses well, has a firm handshake, a shoe shine, and an intense smile? Perhaps, but more than any other quality, I think confidence is found to a greater degree in what we give to others than in what we have within or about ourselves. Confidence has to do with inspiring trust, which you can only do by having faith in other people. Confidence enables you to walk into a room full of strangers and converse with anyone without fear. Confidence imparts poise, and bearing it makes the strangers in that room think, here's someone, someone I not only can talk to, here's someone I want to talk to. An all-at-ease person makes everyone around him feel at ease. Feeling right makes others feel right, and they, in turn, give back what's inside them, the very confidence that you give out. It's like sounding an A for an orchestra. Every instrument with an A string answers in sympathetic vibration. Confidence is the right note and other people's confidence is the sympathetic vibration. It's confidence that makes people want to believe what you say to them, want to accept you as you present yourself. But confidence is more than something that passes between two individuals on their way through the day or through their lives. Confidence is the entire basis of a truly confident person's belief in himself. It's strong enough so that he's able to believe in others. Conversely, distrust in yourself breeds distrust in everyone you meet. A confident person gives you confidence. She creates confidence in others. The strength of her character makes you a stronger character. The question for us here is, how do you and I develop confidence? How do I learn to believe in myself so that others will believe in me too? George Washington was the commander of the American army during our war of independence from Great Britain. Why did the Continental Congress ask Washington to lead the troops? How could a landowner and surveyor, and formerly loyal subject to King George of England, find the strength and confidence to ask his fellow colonists to lay down their lives fighting seasoned troops in the greatest army of the richest, most powerful nation in the world? Although Washington was a British subject, his roots were in America, the world he knew and loved, the land which gave him his life. As a youth, Washington had traveled with the British Army, surveying unmapped territories in the New World while England fought the French and Indian War. So, Washington had first-hand knowledge of both the terrain where he had to fight and of the enemy he would oppose. And because he traveled with the army as a surveyor instead of as an officer, George Washington knew the temper and stuff of the men he would actually have to fight and understood that with fortitude, patience, and confidence in the justice of the colonial cause, his little army kid and would prevail. Largely through his ability to impart his own inner confidence to the men fighting under him, George Washington of Virginia was able to not only win the war against the Redcoats but also to be called the father of his country. And no amount of historical debunking from his time to now has managed to tarnish the image he has left us. George Washington still inspires confidence, and his face is found on that one piece of paper that has the respect of the entire world, the American dollar bill. And here it's clearly a case of the face inspiring the confidence rather than the number on the bill giving value to the face. There are three areas which we have to talk about before you're ready to add confidence to the other building blocks of your unshakable character. Those three are first, developing the quality of inspiring confidence by uncovering your own confidence in who you are and how you were raised. Second, seeing how you can derive confidence from that formal education and training you've received, in the characteristics of your teachers and mentors. And third, drawing confidence from the challenges and experiences you've had in all areas of your life, and the success you've had in dealing with them. Let's look at each one of these areas one by one. First, to grow up at all means that you have certain kinds of vital equipment that are necessary to survive in this tough, technical, highly developed world of ours. Your parents taught you basic skills. How to walk, how to eat, and later feed yourself, what to eat, and perhaps good manners. You were given a certain amount of physical strength and mental endowments. 
Maybe you aren't a rocket scientist, but maybe you know how to fix a lawnmower, something many rocket scientists cannot do. Maybe you don't have a degree in accounting, but you can tell a joke so well that a whole room will roar with laughter. What are your strong points? They had to be there, or you wouldn't have made it this far. Maybe you can save money, maybe you know how to find things, like somebody's lost contact lenses. Chances are you not only have a personal strength, a gift, or talent, or real ability that should be a source of pride and give you real confidence, but it's something you take so for granted that you don't realize what it's worth. We're not talking about what's difficult for you, but about what comes easy. Just because it's easy for you to cut wood with a crosscut saw doesn't mean that it's easy for everybody. Your talent and skill are what you take for granted, and maybe don't value enough. Talent isn't hard work, it's what's a snap. Second, if you grew up in this country, you attended school, and more than likely have a high school education. Here's another case of almost everybody's got it, and I've got it, so why should I take confidence in my diploma? First of all, not everybody's got that diploma, and second of all, this is one of the few countries in the world where almost everyone can read, write, and do math. So, we take for granted something that in the backwoods of nowhere would probably qualify you to be president or the king or the big boss. So, boss, don't sell that sheepskin short because you do have it. You wouldn't think of it as nothing if you didn't have one. Also, your teachers, your mentors who showed you the ropes at the first job or at the new place. They saw something in you that you maybe didn't see in yourself. Want to know what that something is exactly? Well, if you can pinpoint what they gave you, what they showed you, you will see yourself through the eyes of that other person, that teacher or mentor, one friend. Because what they give you is what they see in you already, invisible to yourself. They didn't see that you were capable of running that machine, taking that order, landing that account, making that sale. Just as they were capable then they wouldn't bother to teach you in the first place. They had confidence in abilities that you may not have known you had. And they shared that confidence with you because you already had the skill. You only needed the sharing. Third and lastly, and even more important than where you were born and who your parents are, and whether or not you went to any school or the right school, and whether or not anyone stood by you or showed you the ropes, you have lived, and you are here. So, you have the richest bank to draw upon that there is. You have experience. You may have traveled around the world. You may have known many people and learned the ways of other lands and other languages. Or you may have experienced life in the same place among people you've known all your life and known them in a way that no one on the move forever dealing with new faces and new friends can ever know another person. That's your bankroll. That's where you can learn and draw from with confidence because the thing about experience is it really works. If it didn't, you wouldn't be here. You'd be dead and not caring. And I'm sure that you have some confidence in life because here you're listening to me talk and maybe even getting that sympathetic vibration which is the confident tone that sounds in all of us.